Today's Still Mace Warrior partner is Become Stronger. We want to take the time to thank them for the offer that will be provided during this episode and for teaming up with the podcast to provide a better listening experience for you. You can find out more about Become Stronger at become-stronger.com. Alrighty, guys, Still Mace Warrior here. And uh, today we have someone super, I'm like, I don't, I don't know how to explain this, but you know, I just get happy every time I get yeses for the podcast. I get super excited. Um, this one I'm really grateful for. But we have uh, Coach Paul Gray with us. And I'll go ahead and introduce him real quick. He's the founder of the world-famous Firepower Gym. He is co-founder of Art of Functional Movement Coaching System. He's had, um, you know, he's been around since 1998. He's been working with various types of clients from athletes, everyday people. He's been martial artist for over 30 years, which is cool. He was showing me around his, his dojo right now. It's interesting to see that. And uh, he's been working with kettlebells, maces, clubs. He has, uh, I'm assuming it's kind of like yoga, I guess, eye flows and tactical fitness training. He has great instructional videos on Mason Club, which I'm also going to ask about. And finally, um, we'll talk about that too later on. He has an AFM October workshop coming up in Los Angeles. So if you're in Cali or anywhere near it, you guys have to check it out. So we're going to go ahead and ask him, what's your story in fitness? Um, you know, where did you start? And what led you to all these unconventional tools, including the Mace? Um, okay. First, thank you for inviting me on. And it's, you know, you said um, that, oh, you're just happy when people say yes. And it's, it's the same for me. I, I've been in this game a long time, but I'm happy that um, anybody wants to talk to me. I'm, I'm, I've got no friends, you know, people put up with me. They tolerate me <laughs> <laughs> in my strange kind of, um, my strange way of thinking. So it, it's nice to get to talk to folk, you know, it's, it's kind yeah. of, Kind of like being let out of the asylum for the weekend, you know. So oh, get out of here. Good, That's so funny. good fun. Um, right, this is the story I've kind of told many times. Um, so I'll be brief because um, I think probably most people out there have heard it before. Um, I am from a long-term martial arts background, but I was, I was quite fully, quite ill, sick, mm. sick childhood. And I was born with some scarring on my right lung and diminished lung capacity um, and a very, very low birth rate. And my immune system was really poor. So I was born, born with triple bronchitis and um, kind of chronic problems of that ilk. And all I remember of my childhood is literally being ill constantly. So, you know, whooping cough, um, you know, cold sores all over my face because my immune system was so poor and just being ill and being in pain. And subsequently, I've got a, a, a rheumatic joint condition that's kind of there permanently. So um, when it's cold or damp, it, it, it's worse. I get a lot of pain in the vast majority of my joints. And one of the reasons I started to try and get stronger is because I was not strong in any way, shape or form. I was the sickly kid, you know, right. yeah, as you guys would say, allergies and <laughs> things like that. My allergies. <laughs> I, was, I was always ill and I was always small and I was always quite frail. So somewhere down the line, I got kind of addicted to the old school Hong Kong martial arts movies mm. when, I, when I was a kid, you know, the, the 70s boom of of Bruce Lee, but all of the kind of um, um, Gordon Liu, 36 Chamber of Cha Shaolin, and um, Beardy Lao Ka Lung, you know, Fearless Dragons and things like that. I got addicted to those. And I started to kind of mimic the movements, you know, and I'd copy the, the movements out in, in the garden and I would pick up kind of little improvised swords and weapons and start swinging those things around. And I kind of intuitively picked up that, you know, if I had to be, I mean, I was very, very young at the time. I was born in 74. So, you know, I was only kind of six, five or six or whatever. Wow. I intuitively picked up on all of the stories had one thing in common. You know, there's a good guy and a bad guy. 
and usually the bad guy beats the good bad, good guy's master or some of their family. So the good guy has to get stronger to beat the bad guy. So, you know, in, in my very narrow view of the world at the time, it was all about, okay, I, if, I, if I don't want to be weak uh, and make something of myself, you know, I picked up on the messages in all these films, the, the behind the scenes ethos that, you know, you've got to get off your butt and you've got to put some work in and you've you got to train, you know? Right. So I started to train myself and then eventually um, started formally training in um, orthodox boxing and had my first fight, you know, six or seven or something like that. And wow. went from there into Thai boxing, went from Thai boxing to freestyle karate, went from freestyle karate into Aikido. Um, so all those years you have to physically train, you know, move right. weight classes, drop weight classes, blah, blah, blah. And it got to a point, I think I was about 25, 26, that I'm like, you know what it is? I'm working for a living kind of 50 hours a week and training. Hang on a minute. <laughs> you know, right. like uh, the penny finally dropped. Why don't I just do both at the same time? Yeah. And that's how I got into the fitness industry. You know, it was a conventional industry at the time. You know, right. conventional kind of treadmills, body pump, body combat, spinning classes, circuits, um, bodybuilding training, all of, all of that stuff. And I did that for about 10 years and pretty much did okay, but found I was getting hurt a lot more. Oh, wow. Uh, either a combination of the fact that, you know, I'm not the greatest athlete in the world at all you know i will never ever ever claim to be any kind of world champion at anything because i'm not nothing comes easy to me and nothing physical is natural to me you know it takes a a lot of a lot of work and a lot of graft yeah. um, for me to be half decent at anything i have to work at it put it that way um i hate people that are naturally gifted at things <laughs> Pavel bugs the living snot out of me because he just looks at something and he can do it. You know, he's, he's naturally gifted. And um, no, I, I respect it and I'm envious. I am envious of, of, you know, I'm not saying that those guys don't have to work hard. They do. They work very hard. But they have a natural kind of tendency towards physicality that I just don't have, you know. So I'm envious of that. Pavel. Jim Romig is another. I mean, he he's brilliant he's, he's very gifted gifted upstairs but downstairs too um so i just found i was getting more and more hurt in a combination of not being a gifted athlete or, and um doing kind of close on 30 classes a week plus my own training i just destroyed myself over time right um and i had a had a host of injuries over my years of martial arts and fitness but the big one was when I, I destroyed my, my left hip I, I tore my psoas uh -oh. my hip flexor like shredded that in half shredded my quad and um, tore the attachment of my lower lumbar all in the same day filming an um, independent martial arts film and it was one of those definitely one of those ego things I did not leave my ego at the door right. uh, um we were filming, I threw an axe kick and I heard it tear, as did other people. They kind of thought it was my trousers, you know. Oh, <laughs> um, wow. But instead of kind of going, right, that's me done, we filmed for another eight hours because we only had um, that facility for that day, you know, to film. And I just damaged it and damaged it and damaged it during the fight scenes. And that was it. So that was a, a big lesson to me where it could have ended my career and it could have meant that I would be, you know, walking with sticks or maybe worse from that point onwards, you know, it, it may never ever have healed right. So for six months, I, you know, couldn't walk hardly. Um, for about four months, I couldn't even go to the loo because I tore my TVA. So Right. You know, those internal muscles that you use to go to the toilet and things like that, those were those were torn too, so it's in a pretty bad way. So it was the case of for me, learn how to walk again, 
and try to stand upright. That was the next goal. Then it was, can I do any kind of upper body training? And then it was, okay, if I can do a little bit of training, is there a better way to train? So for me, the original goal was just to be able to walk. You know, if I, if I got that, then I would have been happy. Um, but because I'm stubborn, I just continued to push the boundaries. And it took me about a year, year and a half before I wasn't in constant pain. But in that time, I was looking for different ways to train. You know, I, I realized that the, the overload of what I was doing and not being recovered enough, but also the pattern overload of all of those modalities also overloads lifestyle overload. So because we sit too much, our quads get chronically shortened, our hip flexors get chronically shortened, and then you're doing body pump with like mass amount of like quad work, and then you do spinning with a load of quad work, and then, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right. You know, quads look big, but then your hip flexor tears. <laughs> right. So um, I kind of figured there needs to be a smarter way of doing this. So that's when I looked into alternative methods and came across Paul Check and his his work with the checkinstitute.com and I came across Anthony Deluglio's work with um, Art of Strength, um, Scott Stonen with the TACFIT and um, CST. And that's, you know, when I started to kind of train and, and just copy their videos at first right. before I opened myself up to trying to certify with them. But to be honest, I never thought I'd be physically able to do their certifications. You know, it took me a good few years to build up any level of, of movement or strength again. So my injury was 10 years ago this year. Wow. Um, wow. You can't even, I mean, I, I honestly wouldn't have ever been able to tell because I see, I, you know, I purchased some of your iFlows and then your Spitfire one and I'm like, you're on point. So it's interesting to hear your story. Yeah. You know, many criticize, many, many criticize. They'll look at what I do and, um, you know, they'll say, oh, well, that's just this or that's that or you shouldn't be doing this this way. Um, and we get the opposite end of the spectrum where a lot of people are, oh, it's okay for you, you're flexible. Or it's okay for you, you're, you're not heavy, or you're, you're, you're slim or whatever. And what none of them realize is actually that, one, um, a lot of what I'm doing is working around issues from my past, these injuries and things like that. And there's some things that I don't do now because I still either... They were, they're just not right for my body anymore because of the, the injuries or um, that I know that that movement's not a good movement and, and will contribute to leading towards injury. So there's a lot of things that I see other people doing that they will kind of cast aspersions to me like, oh, oh well, that's not very good or, or that's mm. not done this way or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, come back to me in two years when your knee's blown. Because I can see it's going to happen. You're, you're overloading. And I've learned my lesson the hard way, you know. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Come back to my material in a couple of years' time. But on the other end of the spectrum, you know, there's a lot of people just think I'm naturally gifted at this stuff. And it's not. It's taken me 10 years. It's, it's, it's 10 years in the making to get where I am now. But everything I'm doing now is for five to 10 years in the future because I want to. I don't want to go back over just because I'm getting older. I don't want right. to get weak. I want my movement patterns to de degenerate. And I already have a lot of weaknesses. So I need to kind of, I'm constantly sticking my finger in the, in the dike, you know, trying mm -hmm. to plug weeks. And um, one movement I had to give up on was pistols, you know, pistol squat, um, because of the damage to my hip. So yeah. my left leg if I was trying to do a pistol with my right leg out or my weight on my left leg, clearly just, it wouldn't hold, it would collapse. I had no strength, no stability in that movement. I can squat my body weight, 
but I can't do a pistol. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And every single time I tried, I would just end up in pain and I would end up hurting. So I had to kind of leave my ego at the door and just give up on that movement. And, you know, not every movement is perfect for every person. Right. But seeing that, seeing that, actually, I think it was last week, I was training, I had a couple of my clients here, and one of my ladies, if, if you were on my profile and see my pictures all of the time, you'll see a picture of Kate. And she's one of the older ladies that trains with me, Kate Dawson, she's called Killer Kate, we call And she's 69, and wow. she can just come in and do, she was doing pull-ups this morning. She was doing an each minute on the minute of 10 kettlebell swings and then five pull-ups. Wow, that's you know, intense. That's normal. That's her normal. She she's coming back tonight. She's in twice a day. <laughs> but, but, you know, um, and she was in the other day, and I was pottering about. And she was training, and we were talking. And all of a sudden, I got the urge to try a pistol squat. And this this was last week, and I banged out. I think ten. And that's the first time I've ever been able to do that since the injury. I'd given up totally on that movement pattern because every time I tried, like I said, I ended up in pain. Yeah. But I, I don't train it. I haven't trained it. I haven't practiced it. I just do my other training that it would appear has brought me to a point where I can just access a very poor pistol. <laughs> so... Maybe I can start to work on it now, but it, it, it's taken it's taken ten years, and it's taken um, some very smart training methods that have nothing to do with actually just trying to do a pistol. Right. Every time I tried, I got hurt, so I've had to kind of do other things to help all of my joints and stabilize that have allowed me access to that movement pattern. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Um, so now I can start to train the pistol a little bit because like I said, I'm plugging leaks and I just want to get better. And, um, I just have to be very careful because you know, it's exciting. You know, the first time you pick up a mace and start swinging <laughs> it, you just want to do it all the time. Right. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. I just want to kind of bang out loads of pistols now because I'm like, yes, you know, I can do this, but I know it'll go badly wrong. So I'm right. going to, you know, I'm going to. Take it easy and um, just start to integrate the movement. And I'm patient, you know, talks in the hair in a year or two. Um, let's see where we get. And, so, and I love that. I love that you went into that because I'm, ass I'm assuming there's, you know, a bunch of people with injuries. I mean, they can learn a thing or two from this podcast and from just listening to you on this, on this whole, you know, subject. I look, um, the biggest thing that my biggest bugbear with fitness is it has nothing to do with health and it has become perverted so far away from health that it's all about performance or it's all about how you look. Both of those modalities have nothing to do with health. They have everything to do with narcissism and ego now right. don't get me wrong yeah it is at the end of the day it is everybody wants to be good at something and everybody wants to look good don't get me wrong you know if i wake up in the morning with a huge spot on my nose i'm not a happy guy you know <laughs> it's nobody wants that shit but that that has to be a line and when when fitness becomes all about performance at the expense of health or all about how you look at the expense of health. You can lie to yourself all you want that what you're doing is super healthy and you can look down on somebody eating a McDonald's all you want. But at the end of the day, the, 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 the likelihood is, is you're going to become symptomatic with pain at some point. It's pretty, it's pretty likely that it's going to happen. And um, that's because of your ego or your narcissism and that you're training is nothing to do with health first. And it's one of the reasons that me and Pavel 
it was one of the conversations that me and Pavel had that it, if we went down the route of working together and and um, created the platform for EFM, is it has to be about health first. And yet performance can come as as my ability to to do certain things. Um, for all I am a very poor athlete, for all I'm 45 now and um, I'm like 66 kilograms, 65 kilograms, pound for pound I can outlift a lot of, a lot of guys. So I can perform, but it's taken a long time to build performance on the back of a health training modality. You know, the, you have to be patient if you want to train for the long term. If you want to be doing what people like Steve Maxwell are doing at 60 plus, and like Kate, you know, Kate at 69, if you want to be able to move and be pain free at that age like them, then you have to dial it back and build a foundation of health first. Because doing it the other way around won't work long term. And right. it doesn't. And that's why now I've kind of shoehorned and fell into a position of being the fix-it guy because people that train and train and then they blow the shoulder and train and train and they blow the knee and train and train and the back hurts end up kind of asking the question, oh, well, what am I doing about this? And it's like, well, you know, it's, it's obvious. You know, you're doing the same thing day in and day out because you like, you know, the maze. So you're just doing the maze or you like kettlebell sport or you like rowing but you're just repetitive strain blowing out you know the, the the same motor pattern over and over again you're not recovering that motor pattern you're not doing anything else and there's no balance in your training and if there's no balance there's no health so it is what it is i mean every joint is pretty much unstable through lifestyle so you know your shoulders are tend to be pulled forward because we sit on the keyboards and we, right. cry, we sit with our arms crossed and we eat and we watch TV and then we use the computer and then we use the phone. So this joint, by definition, slowly pulls forward, which means these become chronically shortened, these become chronically lengthened, and then you go and do rowing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, over time the imbalance of the joint chain is going to get worse and worse and worse. And the pain can actually be in the back of the neck or the pain can be that your T-spine pops constantly or you pop ribs out in the back of the T-spine. Common thing with kettlebell guys because they're always in rack. Right. So they, they end up getting a very dysfunctional T-spine. And at the end of the day, it's not just the kettlebell train. And it's a fact that lifestyle gives us certain distortions anyway, and then you overdo and mirror those distortions with some kind of stress and the stress of the sport. And it just is a straw that breaks a camel's back. So once I point out the very kind of simple, you know, uh, come on, dude. <laughs> think it, you know, um, they then buy into the idea of, okay, I just got to do a little bit more of those few silly kind of movements that Paul give me, and it balances things out. And all of a sudden, you know, give them a few months or a few weeks, the pain goes away and they, they achieve a little bit of health and jobs are good. And it, it, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Right. Yeah. Well, okay. So listening to all of this, this is really, uh, where AFM comes through, right? Uh, you guys really implemented, you know, each element and each day, you know, if something changes, right? When it comes to the workouts and stuff like that. And it's really, you know, I'm assuming you guys made it that way so, you know, you can prevent these imbalances or help people with, with all of those issues, right? It, it's balance. I mean, what's the one thing that your body can thrive on or can destroy your body? Pop quiz. Come on, Victoria. Imbalances. No. Wait. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> stress. Oh, stress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So stress can kill us, can cause our immune systems to basically crumble. They can cause our joint chain and body 
to crumble on, on itself. They can cause so many problems that can be brought back down to the fact that we can't handle stress or we are overstressed. So drip feeding stress to our body, the, the type of stress that our body thrives upon can be a very, very good thing. And overloading the type of stress that isn't good for us can be a very bad thing. So the system is actually created around managing stress. So you've got um, hypo stress, which is basically, imagine you just sit on the couch or lie in bed all day. It, it's hypo stress. There's, there's virtually zero stress there. But if you were sitting all day and your quads are going to shorten, that's a contraction of your muscle. Yeah? Right. If your muscle's constantly contracted, then it's constantly under tension. And you will build up residual tension within those muscles from being shortened because they are never lengthened. They never have the balance of doing what a muscle's supposed to do, which is come in and go out. So they build up residual tension, which means they can't lengthen, which means they're under stress, even though you're not aware of it. Wow. It's yeah. there. It's hidden. That's what I call the skeletons in the closet. This is the skeletons in the closet that you don't know are there or you're ignoring. And I've got a little kind of thing. When you, when you do the course, you may have heard from when we did the course at Connecticut, a load of people commenting, oh, I'm digging for truffles. I'm digging for truffles. And that's um, putting your body into positions to find these hidden little areas of stress that you don't need know are there. So you've got to dig for truffles, you know what I mean? You've got to, it, right. it's, it's there somewhere, you know, it's mud, mud, ooh, truffle, found it, yes. You've got to dig for it, you've got to search for it, and once you find it, you've got to deal with it. You've got to deal with that skeleton in the closet. Otherwise, that residual tension and stress will build up and build up and become chronic. It'll become symptomatic and niggle, pain and tightness and dysfunction so that's kind of hypo stress and then you've got eustress which is manageable gentle daily kind of movement the stuff that our body loves the stuff that our body thrives upon that can be light exercise it could be walking running hiking climbing one person's eustress is another person's distress because it you know it depends on your fitness levels and it depends on your mentality you might go for a swim and find that super relaxing me it is horrible i swim like a brick so that's that's like that for me is just hard work and i hate every minute of it and i don't like it and it's not relaxing but for you you may be just like, <laughs> you know so whatever is the you stress that Drip feeds gentle movement to you. Your body loves that stuff and it should do it every single day. So generally, if we think about going for a run, and I'm not talking about an ultra marathon, just a, you know, a run, you know, going for a little bit of a cycle ride, a, a, a hike that's not 45 miles, you know, a few miles hiking or what have you. That, to me, is not exercise. That's just what people should do every single day. That's just maintenance, you stress. Could be yoga or eye flows. It could be a little bit of light kettlebell training, uh, whatever. But that is that should be done every day. Then you've got hypo, or sorry, hyper stress. That's when you're starting to push. Hmm. So you're starting to push a little bit. You're actually now going to take yourself towards heart rate max. Not above, but two. Towards or two heart rate max. So that's more of an intense workout. So it could be, you know, more of an intense sprint session rather than a little light jog. It could be um, like each minute on the minute that the, the ladies did yesterday. Um, or that's hyper stress. We can tolerate that 
and you can certainly tolerate more of it when you're younger you know when you're like 12 like you are you can get away with doing a little bit more of it but if you get older you can't do as much of it it, it it'll grind you down you need more use stress and more recovery but you can do it provided your recovery is on point and you're generally conditioned you can hit a, a good hard workout a couple of times a week as long as you recover from it you're okay and you will thrive off that it's just like taking your car from tootling around um around the block as you would call it to taking it on the highway and giving it a giving it a blast you know what i mean right you don't want to be you know flogging it to death every day but you just open it up a little bit and you know short sharp burst is good for your engine right it just cleans it out blows all of the crap out of the, the exhaust or the tail pipe as you guys call it um and then you've got your fourth type of stress which is distress and clues in the name when you're going above heart rate max you will lose cognitive function you will lose fine motor skills and you will not be able to hold correct structural technique or form and you will just do exercise badly and that's where the vast majority of um, the injuries and accidents come from so if we look at the, the four modalities of stress you have hypo stress so literally doing nothing and tightening up and seizing up that's leaving your motor car on the driveway and not using it your brakes seize up that's people that work a desk job that's everybody that sits more hours than we should sit then you've got distress let's look at the most crazy hardcore workout px90 or you know i'm not going to bash crossfit but let's imagine the world's craziest crossfit workout somebody just going hell for leather that you know they just can't maintain their form or going to a conventional gym and you know just doing their body pump class and putting way too much weight on the bar for the sake of it and just you know killing it right so they're going from season up being too tight to going crazy and trying to abuse themselves for an hour a night in the gym and all they're doing between sit that's why everybody's injured that modality mm. has nothing to do with health and sadly that's 80 percent of the training population at least they go to a desk job or they work all day and then they go to the gym and they're told to push it push it go harder go home you know if the bar's not bending you're pretending all of this bullshit push 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 let's do it woo woo you know led by cheerleaders and boom they've got chronic shoulder injuries chronic yeah. knee injuries blah 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 the magic happens in the middle training you stress you stress you stress you stress hyper you stress you stress you stress you stress hyper so staying within heart rate max if you train like that pretty much day in and day out you never really staying still you're never sitting too much you're always moving always opening up your joints always moving tootling your car around the block all the time up and down the gears and then you give it a blast a couple of times a week if you train like that all the time every now and again you can have a couple of you stress days and it won't matter and you'll not seize up too much but you can also do a crazy eight bonkers workout once every month or two and your body will handle it it'll it'll accept it because it's not being pushed to distraction every single day so yes you could take your car onto the racetrack and put your toe down now and again the problem is it's become culturally accepted to do kind of high intensity crazy bullshit workouts every single workout right and it doesn't work because we're not designed to do it now what do you recommend for like body awareness and just getting people to meet there in the middle i mean it, if someone's it, listening to this and they know they're at that super crazy range right 
of stress? The, the, you know what it is? I can only preach to the convinced. And sadly, here, here's the thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean in and look all serious. <laughs> I, scary, right? Sadly, most people watching this will not listen until they're already hurt. God, that sucks. <laughs> and that's the truth of it. And you know what? I was exactly the same. I learned the hard way. And the thing is, I, I've been saying the same message for 10 years plus. Still, people are only just starting to get switched on. Only just starting to actually realize that there's another way. And that chasing numbers, chasing weight, chasing kind of the perfect six pack constantly, they, they still think that that's healthy. Right. It isn't healthy. It's, it's not healthy. We're not designed to be like that all the time. You know, we have changes in our biorhythms. We have changes in our performance. Some days we feel crap. Some days we feel full of beans. And learning to accept that and ride it and work with your body doesn't mean you're failing. It doesn't mean you're failing. It means you're actually aware and you're content not to strive for somebody else's fake ideology of perfection. I would rather not be perfect by somebody else's standards or ideology, but not be in pain. Because I will get closer to their perfection or their idea of perfection long term because I won't be in pain and I'll get 10 years of training in rather than three crazy years and then have a bust shoulder and not be able to train. So I'm playing the long game. You know? Right. I'm playing the long game. I've been at 66 kilograms now for nearly 20 years. Wow. Well, 64. I was 64 kilograms. I've put two kilograms on <laughs> in kind of 20 years. I'll take that. Yeah. All right. I'm not a cover model. I was never designed to be a cover model. Jesus, I was born at like three pounds or something ridiculous. I had scarring on my lungs. I'm lucky to be bloody alive, you know, so I'm, I'm not going to be a cover model. I, you know, I've got a face like a, you know, a bust football. So <laughs> it's what it is. You know, you know, I accept this. I don't give a monkeys. I'm happy with who I am as a person. And I can still be a good coach, you know, I can still help a lot of people. So I'm happy, I'm content, I'm, I'm fully content with who I am. But I'm not narcissistic, and I'm, I'm not a, addicted to a false ideology of perfection. I'm addicted to the process of trying to be a better version of myself today than I was yesterday. And sometimes better isn't better performance. It just, the, sometimes the best you can do is the fact that you did something. I love that. That's and beautiful. That's, sometimes that's all you've got, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what? You did it. And if you did it and you did it well and you did it with the best technique you can and you knew when to quit, not to push too far because you, it's just one of those days you walk away without getting hurt, and then guess what? You got a good shot at coming back tomorrow and doing a better job at it. Right. That's when magic happens. And it happens over months and over years where your adequate becomes other people's excellence. Just because you've chipped away. You've just chipped away. You've just... You know, it's a huge block of ice that you know inside somewhere there's a swan. And you can't make that swan with five smacks of a hammer right. in, in like 10 minutes. It's hours and hours and hours and little chips. And you know what it is? That's, that's, that's where health lies. I believe anyway. That's my opinion on it. Well, I love, I love your, your, your message. It's beautiful. Now, it's cool that we're talking about this. Now, what do you think about people swinging 
maces that are just ridiculously heavy and you can totally tell that their body's completely off and they shouldn't be doing that weight. Let's talk a little bit about mace. What's your thoughts on that? Because we, we've been seeing this in the mace community. It's, it's, it's people are people are people, right? And it doesn't matter whether it's a mace, whether it's yoga, whether it's... I sh- I've, I've, ju- I've just caught myself saying yoga. <laughs> yeah. Jim, Jim Romick pulled me on that one time when he's going, I love the way you say yoga. It's like yogurt. <laughs> you know, sorry, it's an English thing. Yoga, I should say. Um, yeah, uh, people get bitten into the fact that they've just got to go crazy and try and, you know, it's, it's, ego. it's ego. Everybody wants to be good. Nobody mm-hmm. wants to things. So people are um, not willing to invest the time in the trenches. They just want to go straight to being a, a general. And I, I, I don't know if you understand the, the concept of the time in the trenches. Do you know what, where that terminology comes from? No, go for it. Well, basically during kind of World War One, World War Two, you know, many, many people were dying while World War One in the trenches, you know, and they, they basically ran out of officers and they ran out of men. So they would, they would um, promote people from the trenches. So you, you, instead of having an officer coming from West Point or from Sandhurst, we would call it, all of those were dead. So your officers came from the trenches, so they'd pick the most experienced guy. The one that actually knew what the hell he was doing, hopefully, so that he didn't get the rest of them killed. So you'd have to spend a certain degree of time in the trenches and go through the crap of going over the top and all the scary stuff and all the hard work to get a shot at being promoted to a lieutenant. Mm. And then if you did a job as a lieutenant, you'd get a shot at being promoted and eventually, you know, you might become a general. So it's just the, the, the concept of, you know, you don't get nothing for nothing. None of us walking out of Sandhurst or West Point and just being given a generalship. All of these people that are picking up stupidly heavy maces and trying to swing them and they basically sit behind a desk and then they go and pick up a mace because they've decided that that's what they like doing, which is cool. But instead of investing the time in learning how to do it well and then hours and hours and hours of you know, diligent practice, they try and skip the practice and go straight to the training. Right. And they're not conditioned to it. They try to skip the time in the trenches and go straight to being a general. And it doesn't work. They're either just going to look terrible. You know, their form's going to look ugly as all hell. And you don't have to be an expert with a mace to spot that. You can see them bobbing around like, you know, a drunk all over the place. <laughs> But, you know, any fool can spot that. You know, they're not doing themselves any favors from a professional standpoint. But also, they open themselves up to a higher percentage of possibility of getting hurt. And the big one with mace guys now is low lumbar. Right. That's already happening. And the more the mace gets popular, it's either knee or lower lumbar, depending on whether you're doing mace four or heavy mace traditional style. And mark mark me on this. Give it the next couple of years. If the mace starts getting popularized as it is, the injuries are going to increase. Because I can see it already. I can see it in people already. It's right. either going to be knees, knees with mace floor work, lower lumbar with traditional mace work. Now, how can people prevent that from happening? Like, what should they be mixing with the mace, in other words, in your opinion? It all comes down to the same problem as what everybody has, is that we all live the same lifestyle. So we all have the same postural distortions from sitting too much and driving too much and what have you. So those distortions are across the board pretty much in every civilized country in the world now. It is what it is. Shoulders and the shoulder joint is imbalanced forward. Hips and lower lumbar is lordotic and imbalanced backward. So there is more stress in T-spine and lower lumbar 
and there's more stress on the unstable joints of the shoulder and the knee. So that's just a given. That's everybody, regardless of whether you train or not. And I've got a little point on that that really makes you think you, you'll, you'll like this. I hope. Um, but the minute you pick any training modality, whether it's the mace or rowing or whatever, if you are not dealing with the structural training to balance out those joints, you're going to add stress to unstable joint structure. So it doesn't matter whether it's a mace. It doesn't matter whether it's kettlebell training. It doesn't matter whether it's conventional training. Bodybuilders have bad backs and bad shoulders too. Because they sit and they're cab drivers or truck drivers or you know, they're, they're, they're accountants just the same as everybody else is. So if you're not training to offset the lifestyle that we all live first and foremost primarily before your sport or hobby, your hobby is likely to augment the problem. I like that. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And I hope the it's listener, the listeners really take that on because that's... It's, it's common sense. It's common yeah. logic. Why are the world's trainers not switched onto this? Why are most trainers still putting some form of weight or tool into people's hands when they're structurally imbalanced from lifestyle and they're not dealing with the lifestyle first? What, why is this still happening in 2018? I'm, I'm a pretty stupid person and I can figure this shit out. So come on, there's brighter people out there than me. You know? All right, right. Seriously, come on, guys. We've got to do a better job. We have to do a better job because injuries are not getting lower every year. This is a fact. If you go and look at the injury rates through casualty in all of the hospitals in the U.S., those numbers are not coming down. With increased sports science and increased um, training availability, you can go online and train with you know, good trainers all over the world now. Why are the numbers not coming down? Why? Right. There's only one common denomination because people are not dealing with lifestyle. They're still trying to push performance or aesthetics instead of health. It, it, it's the only thing I can come up with. And in my coaching with people, mostly the broken, this is how we deal with it and it works. Yeah. Well, that's, wow. You opened my mind up. Hmm. <laughs> my I mind mean, is open right now. You kicking yourself. Why didn't you think of that, right? Yeah, I'm like, oh. <sighs> God, I'm going to have to change my lifestyle now. No, no. You, at the end of the day, just be sensible. And you've got to, if you're going to pick up any sport, be it CrossFit or Mace or whatever, put the time in the trenches diligently, work on your skill of that sport before you start working the performance and, and put time into the skill. And you don't have to kill yourself every single day. In fact, it's best not to. You know, you don't have to go crazy with the weight every single day. You don't have to do hours. You know, you have diligent training. And all of the trainers out there that I respect, usually now, you know, it's not the 25-year-old kids doing backflips on a football. It, it's not... You know, um, it's the 45, 55, 65-year-old year old guys that are still training and training very well. And, and half the time, they can out-train these 25-year-old kids, but they can't do it every single day. <laughs> they just they, they can't. And it, it's, it's that ideology of, um, you know, when, when you're 18... If you, were to, if you were to run against your dad or your mom in a race when you were 18 and they're kind of 30 or 40 or whatever, the likelihood is you will be able to outdistance them, right? Right. But if you were to arm wrestle them, 
they're just nail you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they're in a different phase of their life. They're not in an, an endurance phase. They're in a strength phase of their life. So if you think about it, when you, you're kind of 15 through to 30, 35, maybe 40 with good nutrition, you know, you, you naturally have more energy, more endurance. You know, so if you're training kind of is more endurance based and you might be using lighter weights but going for longer time periods during that phase of your life great but as you start to get a little bit older you get into your 40s you know maybe early 50s or mid 50s you just can't do that anymore it takes you longer to recover and you know you you you, you your strength should increase though You'll be lifting heavier weights. You just can't do it for as long. Hmm. And that's, that's just an observation. I've got no science that backs that up. That's just an observation of working with people for 20 years. Right. Um, right. And it, it's a generalization as well because, like I said, Kate, who's 69, she can pretty much do the same workout as some of the 29-year-olds. And sometimes she can go longer than them. But the thing is, is it's taken her 10 years of training with me or whatever to be able to do that. Her, her adequate is their excellence. But that, it shouldn't be that way. The kid should naturally be able to out endurance the older guy. Right. If that kid at 29 had trained for 10 years, they would be able to do it, you know? So yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, we have natural phases in our life that if we are, if we leave our ego at the door, if we're content with training for the sake of training, training to enjoy, not doing workouts. We don't do workouts, we train. And if you train because you enjoy it and you train to be a better person, tomorrow than you were today and you train because it's fun and you train because you're looking to be a athlete there is no word for a health based athlete so i made one athlete i like it so it's not about performance if you can tend to, to be that way you know your adequate will be most people's excellence, especially with today's lifestyle where, you know, 20 year olds are out of shape and they can't move and they can't right. squat for me, you know, ask the yeah. grass, they can't do that. But it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about your, um, your, I, I think you just released it. Well, like two days ago, your Mesa instructional video. I know it's on Vimeo. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, I've been using the mace kind of, I think about six years now. Um, five, six years, something like that. I, I, I came to the mace on the back of working with clubs and working kind of CST, um, club work, and developing my own little vibe with, with clubs. And I'm not... I'm not an aficionado of clubs on mace. It's not my, my favorite thing. I'm not like totally addicted to it. Um, Pavel is way more into maces and, and clubs than I am. And I know that, you know, I, I, I've, I've hung around Rick enough to know he's like crazy mace guy. And <laughs> you know, a lot of people just nuts about it. And I am not. My, my job is to be proficient in that skill because I'm an all-rounder. I'm happy to be adequate in many, many modalities so that I can take what I need. And I would hope my adequate is a lot of people's excellence. I would, I would hope that's the case because I am, I am very skill-based. And I look at club work and mace work from the modality of having trained with the sword quite a bit. Um, come from, you know, the Japanese Kenjutsu sword and samurai sword training background. And the mechanics of using a sword to hand style in, in that style, the mechanics of the way you use your hips and your body lend themselves to baseball, 
golf and using a club or a mace. It's the same hip mechanics, it's the same lower leg mechanics and the same hand position. So to me, using a club and a mace is just exactly the same. So all I do is lay one set of principles to using either a club or a, or a mace. And all I've done with Mace Magic is, I think, I think it's about two hours or more of content. And as I've laid down what I feel is the basics of traditional Mace swinging. So it's how I see it. It's, it's through my lens. Right. And hopefully there's some gems in there that will preempt the injuries I predict in the lower lumbar from traditional mace swinging. So right there's, there's some gems in there specifically for that. But essentially it goes through in you know, all your traditional movements plus a few of the way I like to throw things together in my sequence and work. It's not floor work. Um, Leo is kind of doing floor work. It's not that. It's my sequencing of putting one movement into another movement into another movement. You could call it flaws, but I, I don't see it that way. Right. It's just sequence and exercises together. So it's got some, some stuff about that. And if I was to run a mere certification, which may happen at some point, or AFM may, may do that, it will have all of the basic information you need to pass the technical side of the cert. Um, but there'll be a physical test inside of the cert, which there's also a little um, heads up on how to do, you know, the test as it were. Right on. So right on. All, all I'm doing with all of my downloads, I've got now, I've got about two hours 45 on the Turkish Get Up toolbox. There's, there's nearly three hours of how to master the Turkish Get Up. Right. And one of those things that it, it, it hardly sells because everybody in their you know, arrogance thinks they know the Turkish Get Up. Yeah. But everybody that does buy the Turkish Get Up toolbox goes, shit, I didn't know the Turkish Get Up until I watched that. So <laughs> okay. Kind of so there's about three hours of material on that and there's about six hours on my complete kettlebell and essentially all I filmed that for really was to put material on my membership platform on the website so my mentorship students have tutorials on how to do things properly it's the same with the iFlows material it's the same with complete club bell and complete club bell 2 is coming soon um, athletic body weight conditioning, which is, if you want to look at it as the next level to Spitfire, and athletic body weight conditioning too is coming soon. All of this stuff, I'm really just filming for my guys and for my um, mentorship and membership program. It's material to go on there. But the guy that's a lot more stuffy than me who runs my um, website is like, Paul, you should sell these as downloads. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, if you like, yeah, if you want. <laughs> I'm glad because then I wouldn't have access. Big shout out well, to him. I'm like the world's worst guy for marketing and, um, and putting my stuff out there. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeless at it. You know, Pavel's brilliant at marketing. He, he'll just write something. <laughs> a picture of like you know his eye or something and everybody will just <laughs> oh my god it's amazing and, you know, I, 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 I don't do that so literally <laughs> at his behest that I put this material into a, a downloadable package and really you know it's just because he was badgering me that I should do it so if, if people want it it's there if they don't want it I don't care yeah. my mentorship students can get access via the platform. So everything I film in a downloadable product, my mentorship clients get as part of the package anyway. And that's really what I'm, I'm doing. I'm, information I've had in my head for 10 years, I'm finally getting on film. That's and, awesome. And, that, that, that's awesome. That's an awesome project. 
Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about the AFM workshop in October. You're coming down to Los Angeles, California, which I was really excited because last time you guys came to the East Coast and I was like kind of jealous. I was like, what the heck? I was like, when are you guys coming out of Cali? And like a couple of months later, you guys announced it. So yeah. Uh, yeah, let's talk about that. Where were you in 2015 and 2016 when I was in LA? Where were you then? I was probably just watching uh, Paul Wall on fucking YouTube, to be honest. Like you were another, like back then. Watching. I was like CrossFitter, kettlebells, doing everything like really retarded, probably. I don't know. <laughs> uh, right. But yeah, I, it, it happened a couple of years ago where we we taught AFM certs in the UK AFM certs in Poland and Norway. And it was like, you know, there's all these cool guys in the States and, you know, a lot of my mentor mentors are from the States and the coaches I trained with. And it was like, you know, it, it would be cool to, to open the door into the States and kind of get AFM over there. And the way it worked out, I just took a huge, huge risk and a gamble and, I was like, look, I want to go to the States. Is there anybody out there willing to, to, to host a workshop or whatever? And God love him, Jim Romick, again in Salinas. He was, he was head of Wolf Fitness. Wolf Fitness was still around at the time. Um, and he's co-founder, but he was, he was running Wolf Fitness back in 2015. He said, yeah, it'd be great to have you out here. You know, come on, dude, let's make it happen. And and Jim was great. He gave me my my shot. So we I managed to blag um, an iFlows days workshop there and met some amazing guys. Um, one of my closest friends now, Scott Stevens. Um, still, me and Scott talk almost every night. We talk about boring shit like Star Trek and things like that. And you know, <laughs> I met. And I did a workshop at Eric Doyle's place as well. We we did Salinas and then Jim. Um, actually, have you seen my post today with the picture, the memory I shared? No. It, it, I just woke up like an hour ago to do this. <laughs> no, have, a look, have a look afterwards. Literally, it's, it's three years today. This memory's popped up where I was supposed to be flying from Monterey Airport down to LA for my workshop and the flight got cancelled. Oh no. Gum, I had to get a hotel which was right next door to um, a porn establishment. But I didn't go in, honest, you know. I never looked I never literally put my head in the door. Uh, I had to get a hotel for the night and Jim had to come and pick me up and drive me down to LA the five hours you know, the next day because my flight was cancelled. That's literally like that memory's come up today, three years ago. <laughs> so I went down and I did a, a workshop at Eric Doyle's place when he was still at his old um, Long Beach Kettlebed Bell facility. Mm. And I met Hunter Cook and Eric and Rick. That's the first time I met Rick as well. And then flew home. And then the following year, I went out and did East Coast and West Coast. We did San Francisco, um, Reading with Jim again, up in Balance Point Fitness, then back down to Eric Doyle's place. Wow. And then out to meet Kelly. And, you know, it's, yes, Kelly. It's, oh, she's awesome. I know. She's a sweetheart. I love her. Fantastic. And it's funny, we've got the same background under some of, some of the same mentors. We both trained under Deluglio in the art of strength and it's so weird that literally she took her certification under anthony um on the cert before i went i i did november kind of 08 or 09 and i think she did um she must have done like three months before or something like that so yeah, yeah. kind of neat met all of those years ago and it's it's strange how we've gone full circle to meet you know <laughs> Two years ago, it's yeah. you know one of the good things about social media is, you know, you kind of make those connections with people, and you know, I owe Jim a lot, Scott Stevens a lot, uh, and Kelly for opening the door to at least the interest in the FM. Yeah, 
And, you know, Pavel didn't manage to make it out on the first two trips, but he managed to make it um, to Kelly's last time, which was, which was great. You know, I'd kind of at least go in there by myself. I think I built up a little bit of a level of trust with some people that knew I knew what the hell I was talking about, as well as, you know, not being a total ass hat, I suppose. And that opened the door for us both to be able to come out. And, you know, it, it, it sparked the interest, I suppose. So right. it, it was great. So, yeah, we're coming out to LA, hopefully, in, when is it, October? 23rd, yeah. right? Yeah, crap, I need to get my flight sorted. And- <laughs> Oh no! You better not miss it. I signed yeah. up already. <laughs> um, I'll I'll get a canoe and I'll just start paddling now. You know, I, I'll be there. <laughs> you know, it's all going to be good. I don't stress about these things like I used to. But yeah, I'm I'm going to go out to Kelly's uh, the weekend before. Uh, I'm going to do a little workshop with Kelly, and we're keeping it small and intimate. Intimate <laughs> with her words. We'll keep it intimate and we'll have a Q and A. And we'll 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 talk and we'll dancing and I can't uh, wait till she watches this. I hope she you kicks your butt. Oh, <laughs> you laugh. She's dancing. She has that kind of little vibe about her. And uh, yeah, we're just, we're just gonna keep it small and we're gonna have fun and we're gonna kinda we're gonna feed off questions. We're not just going to go and deliver material. We're going to feed off questions and, you know, try and work around, make it more of a, of a personal um, a fix it session. Let's see, let's see what problems people are coming up with and let's, let's, let's fix it and go from there. And it, it'll be good. It'll be cool. And then because I've got a week till LA, I promised Matt Burberry I'd get up to his place at some point. So uh, right I called on. or messaged Matt and said, right, okay, look, I'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> I always point at it because everyone's always mad- mentioning Matt. I'm like, Not you know, Matt, Matt, Matt's the coolest, sweetest guy. I love him a bit, you know. So I said to Matt, look, I'll, 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 do, this, I'll do the gig with Kelly and then if you want, I'll fulfill my promise. I'll come up to your place and we'll do something. And I don't care what it is. I'll spend a couple of days up there. And I'm happy to sleep at the gym. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I've been homeless, you know, when I was younger. I, I can sleep under a bush. It makes no difference to me. So if you want to run a workshop, we'll run a workshop. If you want me to work with you and you are Leon personally, great. If you want me to troubleshoot your PT clients, I'll do that. But we'll hang out for a couple of days and, doesn't matter about the money. I'm not, not off, you know. So I promised him for his support. I would try and give something back. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make good on that for him. You know, right you, you got to pay back the pillars of your support. That's yeah. One of the the mantras that one of my mentors drilled into me, and you know, I I, I do believe that. You know, you pay back the pillars of your support, and and Matt has been one of the early people to latch on to me, Pavel, and or AFM, and actually just throw his money in the hat straight away. And right. you've got to pay that back. So I'll hang out with him, and then I'll head out to LA. And right on. I don't know if I'd be there too beforehand. I've got no flights booked as yet, so I'll just, I'll, I'll wing it. Right on. And there's still some spots <laughs> available, right? For the for the LA one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The, All right. we're, we're at um, Anthony Eisenhower's place. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, I forgot to mention Anthony. Bloody hell. Sorry, mate. Anthony Eisenhower at Brood 9. I, I, um, the, the twice I went to LA, I visited Anthony too and um, went to his facility, Brood 9. And him and Dimitri, they're, they're real cool guys. He's, yeah, yeah. He's just, he's one of those guys that's addictively optimistic and full of energy and <laughs> it just put himself out for you you know what I mean and yeah uh, he was so busy last time we went but he was like hey yeah I'll meet you for a coffee and I'll, I'll make some time and you know we we didn't have time to 
to, to do much or to do a, a workshop or whatever, but he made time, a couple of hours to, to have a coffee and, you know, to hang out and he's a good guy. So he's lent us his facility uh, for the workshop. So Right on. Good. He was Blue Power Ranger too. <laughs> right? Yeah, from Power Rangers in, sp- in space. Anthony Eisenhower, he, that was him. What? He's, he's a he's a stunt man. He's a stunt man. Martial right arts. On. I so I think he did all of the stunt work for. That's Blue so Power cool. Rangers. So he 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 is a cool guy. He's a wow. Real, and apart from being a good fitness trainer and running the facility, and he trains a lot of like Muay Thai and groundwork and fight work. He has um, I believe it's like a stunt work workshop and program. Where you can actually learn how to take hits and you know things like that. So that's he, interesting. Yeah, he's a real cool guy. You should reach out. I don't know. Do you know? Anthony? No. You Anthony yeah. Power at Brood Nine Martial Arts. You reach out to him. He's such a cool guy. And yeah, that's interesting. All right. Um, so I'll go ahead and add all the links. This is obviously going to be on a blog, so it'll be below. Or if you're on YouTube, you can read it in the description. I'll add a link to the workshop, a link to your website in case someone wants to check out Mace Magic and uh, check you out on your Instagram. Man, it was, uh, this was awesome. We Instagram most of the time. I'm, I'm like a dinosaur of social media. <laughs> and things go wrong and I hand the phone to the kids and stuff like that. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> You'll not see anything yeah. interested on my uh, <laughs> iPhone, for sure. <laughs> but um, you're very, you, I'm, I'm very grateful you'll do that anyway. It's, it's yeah, you, I do it for everyone. I'll go ahead and add your links. Um, so go check out coachpfg.com, right? That's where they can check you out. Um <laughs> Yeah. And um, I'm just, <sighs> thank you. Thank you for saying yes and, and for doing this podcast with me. I know listeners are going to just love it or maybe hate it. Maybe because they don't like if, to hear those injuries, injury things, you know, but you know what? It's it, true. If, if they hate it, it's good because that means it's touched a nerve and they're getting defensive. Right. And that's good because that's good. at some point, if they get hurt or if they just naturally decide that, you know, they don't want to train this way anymore, they want to train that way or blah, 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 whatever, whatever um, reason or rationale, that it'll come back to them. Right. If they just completely don't care and it doesn't kind of, you know, make them think or tweak anything, then I can't help that person at all. Right. You know, I, so I would, I would, I would say it's better if it makes you angry. If 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 you don't like it, it makes you angry. You know, the truth hurts. Maybe I've touched a nerve, and if you're getting defensive or you just disagree with this, good. At least you're thinking. At least you're thinking about it. Yeah. And if it's in a year or two years or three years that it comes back to you, that maybe. There might be something in it, or maybe you want to try it. Good. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because you should, you should at least think for yourself, and you should at least be open-minded to try things. And everybody's capable, but not everybody's ready, and it's not the right time for every single person. So as long as if there's something I've said that just – isn't right for you right now, don't dismiss it. Maybe put it on the back burner uh, and let it bubble there till the time's right. And well, yeah, yeah. Just be open to the possibility and we'll see what happens then. I'm probably going to listen to this podcast a few times because you gave me, you know, some good nuggets in this one. Golden nuggets. Yes. Truffles. <laughs> or truffles. You got a hunt for that. Gold rush. Yeah. Nuggets. All right. Thank you All anyway. Right. And it's been, a, it's been a pleasure to meet you. And how do you pronounce your second name? Islas. Islas, right. Islas, like island. But in yeah, Spanish, we, Islas. We, I, was like, I was like, Islas, uh, Islas, is Islas. <laughs> okay, so at least now I know I can get that right. I hate yeah. that known. <laughs> right on. Well, you thank got any, you. any yeah. specific questions? 
BFM or any um, prep you want to do or whatever. Come on, hit me up. Um, okay, so for people attending AFM, including me, like, what do you recommend we, like, read prior or, you know, um, watch? Right. Um, I would say really get to grips with your... Um, have a look at your weak areas. If you strength train, start working on your mobility more. If you do a lot of high intensity, start working on your recovery more. And recovery and mobility are not necessarily exclusive. Um, if you do a lot of movement work, start strength training more. Start to look at where you're imbalanced okay. in the cycle. And maybe just put a little bit of prep time into one of or two of the weak areas or what you perceive as your weak area. So if you don't lift heavy, then maybe just start to put a little bit of time across to that. If you lift heavy all the time but do very little recovery, maybe put a little bit of time aside for that. So just start to try and address some balances so that maybe you're a little more rounded okay all right that would be my advice you don't need to read anything as such because you're going to get it <clears throat> on the days and to, to a degree you want to come into it i mean efm people are starting to get the gist of what we're about um so we can't turn up and just go ta-da and everybody goes oh my god i never heard <laughs> Because people are starting to know what we do a little bit now. We, we don't get the, the wow factor as much because people get it already. Right. Um, but still, there's a lot of specifics that will deliver on the day and you may as well get them on the day and enjoy it in the atmosphere of, of, of the workshop and the course. And I don't want to take anything away from that. I want people to go there and get their money's worth. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, We'll leave the cerebral stuff and just say from the physical side of things, maybe just have a, have a little guess at, at where your circle may have a flat edge. Okay. And let's try and round off that edge a little bit and, and, and see if we can address some imbalances. And that's as much as you're going to need. Right on. All righty. So if there's any listeners that are going to the AFM, there you go. That was my question. Now, if you guys have questions, you can leave it in the comments, and I'm pretty sure Paul will get back to you, right? If I can find out how to answer the comments, of course I will. Um, <laughs> Don't be a dinosaur. <laughs> Email me or PM me. <laughs> right on. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on this podcast. I totally appreciate your, your time. Um, I just feel blessed. Blessed. All right. May the universe always flow with you. Yes, you're very welcome. And thank you very much. And you have a great day. Get some more coffee. I need more coffee. <laughs> Me too. All right.